please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Straight then to our budget special, our finance correspondent Tim C. Jaipuria caught up with the CBDT chairman Sushil Chandra and started by asking him about the concerns triggered by tax on long-term capital gains. Let's hear in to what he had to say. You must have seen the figures of uh, untaxed long-term capital gains. From the returns we found that in last year, 3,67,000 crore of long-term capital gain was shown in the returns, which was absolutely untaxed. And this was creating a bias against the manufacturing because the returns are very high and they are absolutely tax-free. And simultaneously, the treatment of long-term capital gains vis-a-vis -vis other assets is also in favor of the long-term capital gains mm. of the shares. So it was thought that we should put some tax on, on the long-term capital gains of the shares and equities because the market is absolutely matured. Now, absolutely, they can understand that why the tax levy is essential into that. So we put a 10% uh, long-term capital gains on the equity part, which was absolutely untaxed so far. However, the short-term gains, the same, same regime as the 15%, which was earlier, so there's only one 10% capital gain, which is still in favor of the equity, considering the other assets. So there's also a concern, and a lot of uh, investors are feeling that they should now probably do a portfolio churn because they feel that this long-term capital gains tax is also going to impact their investments in the mutual funds, etc., which were earlier considered to be a tax-saving instrument. How do you see that? How would you like to ally? How would you take those concerns? Number one, I would like to say that up to one lakh rupees of capital gain is exempt in the hand of each and every individual. So we have kept it absolutely clear that for small or middle investors, there is still no long-term capital gains of two rupees one lakh. As far as the mutual funds are concerned, which you are mentioning, mutual fund has got two types of funds: is a growth fund and the dividend-oriented funds. So till now, the long-term capital gain tax as well as the dividend was absolutely tax-free in India. Therefore, there was no tax on the mutual fund, whether you go for uh, uh, long-term capital gains or you go for the dividend purposes. So now the dividend, if the whole income of the mutual fund is being distributed through the dividend rather than through the long-term capital gains, mm -hmm. so we have put the same tax of 10% while distribution of the dividend. However, in the hand of the recipients, the dividend will be absolutely tax-free as, as any other dividend, tax, dividend is concerned. So I would say that for small investors, for middle-class investors, there is absolutely nothing to fear about it, that uh, they will be taxed more or they will be taxed less because up to one lakh rupees is still tax-free, long-term capital gains with them. So what about uh, where investments are more than one lakh? Over there, they, they'll face 10% uh, DDT on the mutual funds wherever they receive dividends. Is that the case? This is not the DDT, I would say hmm. that. It is hmm. <coughs> that the mutual funds, how does they accumulate the income? I think we'll have to understand hmm. it very clearly. Hmm. Mutual fund derives income from long-term capital gains, from yeah. short-term capital gains, yeah. maybe from dividend, hmm. and some part of the interest. Hmm. So their income is have been subjected to, should have been subjected to 15%, 10%, 30%. Hmm. But because mutual fund is a see-through and we are not taxing mutual fund, hmm. so therefore only where the, where the dividend is being given to them, if it hmm. would have been given through the company, then it would have been subject to DDT. Hmm. So we are paying the mutual fund will pay tax per, 10 hmm. percent tax on hmm. the dividend if it is given to them. Hmm. Otherwise, they would have not given a growth-oriented uh, returns because that would have been subject to 10 percent this thing and they hmm. would have the siphoned off this thing through the dividend. Hmm. Because the dividend so you are trying free. to plug that loophole. So plug to that, that's all. So let's, let me now come back to the corporate tax uh, re reduction, reduction that you've done. Uh, to be precise, with an increase in the CES, there is a feeling that the overall rate, because CES has been increased from 3 to 4 percent, the overall effective rate comes back again to 29 percent. However, there's an understanding that government was wanting to reduce it to 25 and up to 250 crores of turnover. That's what the announcement was. But once we see the fine print, there is a concern that with the increase in CES, it comes back to 29, so which means there's no reduction. No, I think it is absolutely misunderstood uh, by the persons in the field that way. Mm. <coughs> we have put the tax as 25% mm. up to the turnover of 250 crores. Mm. CES is the charge and the levy on the tax. It is not the levy on the income. 
so it cannot be 25 plus 4, 29 percent. It will be on 25 percent, a 4 percent. It means this is 26 percent. So it is not 29 percent. That has to be understood very clearly. And they will have a lot of surplus now. So coupled with this, I would like to come that the, the, the budget will have to be seen as an overhaul thing, thing. We cannot see in isolation that you have put a tax on the 10% of long-term capital gain. Hmm. Hmm. But there's a lot of surplus available with the corporates now. Hmm. Because of reduction of the tax rate to 25%, there's a surplus with the salaried class employees also. There's a surplus with the old uh, citizens also, the senior citizens also. So there is a more surplus which is available that can be invested in equity or otherwise. And our market is very mature, which has absorbed and understood the concept of the whole long-term capital gains as well. Sir, uh, let me also ask you one thing, which a lot of uh, large corporates are looking to hear from you. What happens to the remaining 1% uh, assessees, the corporate tax assessees, who have been left over with the demand? Their hopes are still there that they would also get soon have a reduction in corporate tax from 30% to 25%. You've left out 1% tax assessees. Why so? And how soon they will also get this benefit of a reduced corporate tax in India at 25%? If you remember, the finance minister in the first budget speech has said that gradually we will make it movement towards 25%. Last year, if you see that we have reduced the tax rates up to the turnover of 50 crore of companies, hmm. Now we have reduced it up to 250 crores, hmm. meaning thereby that 99% of the companies hmm. are into the regime of 25%. Only 7,000 companies are there which are paying 30% hmm. tax rate. Hmm. But the effective rate, if you see, of these companies also, we have analyzed that also, it comes to 26%. Because they have got certain deductions, certain exemptions, which have, though we have cleared that they have been deleted from the act, but they have a time bound for 10 years, for mm, the 8 mm, years. Mm. So they are still occupying those particular things. They are still utilizing those, those deductions. And their effective rate is only 26%. So we are moving into that direction of a low tax regime. And uh, with the deductions, their rate is also 26%. We also caught up with Agricultural Secretary S.K. Patnayak, who is confident that the sector will continue to grow at over 6% in FY19. He also talked about the government's plan to tap the global markets for agricultural products and added that the export policy on producing enough for domestic and cater to international markets is going to be put in place. I think it, uh, the allocation which has come to us is quite satisfactory. In fact, we are getting less than 10% in the past few years. So is much more than uh, what we expected. So I would say um, the government has really taken care of this sector in a very big way. Right, sir. But then when we talk about the areas that we were lacking or what were the challenges, could you elaborate that and how will the budget incentives that have come in help you overcome those? See, you, we have witnessed a very good production year during mm -hmm. the 16 and 17, especially if you see our production touched 275 million tons of food grains and 300 million tons of horticulture produce. But uh, there were some problems in terms of realizing the full value of that those uh, commodities. And that is why, to some extent, there has been tension in the minds of the farmer, hmm. because the, the, the price was, the uh, in fact, the issue. Hmm. So if you see this budget, the, this budget has corrected that particular uh, accent front. It has shifted it from production towards more towards marketing, supply chain, logistics, hmm. post-harvest. So uh, to that extent, it's, a, it's an excellent budget. Just to give an example, the, the government has already made it stand clear on uh, the MSP. Hmm. And it has, uh, it has uh, really made a paradigm shift in terms of how people aggregate their uh, produce. Uh, you know that the farmer producer organization is going to get a big fillip because their income for the next five years after it is set up is going to be exempt from income tax. Mm -hmm. This will really spur growth in different parts of the country and it will help farmers to unite to aggregate their produce and take it to the market and bargain for a better price. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, you would have seen in the budget that uh, they have uh, uh, sort of uh, articulated the uh, construction of what is called the gram, the mm. gram in rural agricultural market. You know, between the uh, rural hearts, which was purely unorganized, and the APMC, which is organized, there is no intermediate body. Mm. So this gram is going to fill that gap. Mm. In other words, even today, the farmer just cannot take his produce to the agricultural producers marketing committee and sell it. Mm. It is done through traders. Right. But 
by visualizing a gram the farmer actually takes this to that gram mm -hmm. and from gram the bigger aggregators or the food processors or the uh, various other suppliers can really source their agricultural produce from this gram so mm -hmm. we intend creating the required infrastructure at these points and these will be very close to the existing villages so mm -hmm. it will not be something very far away from where the farmers are producing that so it's really uh, the present budget really addresses these gaps in a very big way these are only one or two examples but i you know for sure there have been other initiatives mm -hmm. like the uh, the government has spoken about uh, on the lines of operation flood mm. to launch operation green mm. where potato tomato and uh, onion mm. can uh, really be linked uh, between the clusters where it is grown and the markets where it is required mm. so that there is the price volatility does not affect the farmer and at the same time the consumer the, uh, the need of the consumer is also taken care of that operation green for which 500 crores has been earmarked mm. is something a very revolutionary concept and these uh, these issues were uh, already there but it's something which is uh, very new and uh, just to give another example is the creation of the fund for dairy development i mean not dairy development animal husbandry animal development agriculture. which will essentially focus not only on the traditional cows and buffalo mm. but also small ruminants like the goats lambs uh, sheep this uh, this will also get a very big fillip uh, and apart from the fishery development fund which roughly between the two it is 10,000 crore corpus which is going to be set up and the state governments can access these funds for the development. The small ruminants never got a hmm. um, uh, priority in our, in our uh, 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 schemes That's in the past but this is going to alter the uh, landscape of the animal husbandry sector. And why I say that animal husbandry sector? Because in order to double farmers' income, mm. we need to tap this potential which at present actually is neglected. So it's definitely something I, I would say there is a paradigm shift in the way in which we are looking at agriculture. Right, so while you believe that there are many sections of the society, uh, especially people from Swaraj Abhyan and the Farmer Society we spoke to, they are saying that the calculation of the MSP will be critical uh, because uh, when uh, there are two uh, calculations which will be taken forward. Now, Niti Aayog has been given the task of going ahead and talking to ministries and doing the calculation, but as the Agriculture Secretary, what is your view? What should be the calculation? There? See, the question is, of course, this has been uh, tasked with the Niti Aayog as you rightly said, so I have nothing much to comment on that. But what uh, you would see, what the government has essentially articulated is that the cost of cultivation, the cultivation mm. cost plus 50 percent should reach the farmers. Mm. And that is what the guarantee the government has given. Mm. There are several commodities in which the um, 50 percent more than the cost of cultivation even at present is not been given. And we have 25 notified crops under MSP. Mm. So, uh, so therefore, if actually it is given now that the government has said, it's going to change really the lifestyle of the farmers. So it's, it's a very big improvement of what things are at present. And I think it's a very welcome move, pro-farmer and oriented towards farmers' welfare. So good to have you back here on Business Saturday. And on to the big highlights from our special presentation, the CNBC TV 18 and Mint budget verdict. Let's start with some excerpts of our interaction with Railway Minister Piyush Goyal then, who has ruled out any increase in railway tariff at the present. Talking to us, the minister also said there was no tariff hike under proposal for the time being. I'll have a double advantage by doing the development of stations which the Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Finance Minister has announced on an EPC model initially, mm. so that the benefit of that starts flowing to the passengers and the public at large. And simultaneously, I mitigate the risk of the railway involvement when the people actually monetize the assets. So there's efficiency and there's monetization that you're looking at to be able to achieve that two lakh uh, uh, revenue number. What about tariffs? Uh, is tariff a pillar at all in no, that in that strategy? No, no. No proposal. If I increase it any further, the balance freight will go to the road, and balanced passengers will go in the uh, to the airlines, and I'll be left in any case holding a loss-making organization. 
From railway soaring to aviation, then the Minister for State for Civil Aviation, Jayant Sinha, is confident that the sale of Air India will be completed by the end of 2018. Talking to us here at CNBC TV 18 and the Mint Budget Verdict, the Minister also said that the Navi Mumbai Airport project will be completed within three to four years going ahead. The information memorandum will be out very shortly, within a couple of weeks it will be out. Uh, then, uh, you know, the whole uh, bidding process will start, all the data, uh, all of the information that is necessary to put a bid together will be available. Uh, we will expect uh, people to then, uh, you know, take the RFP and actually put bids together. And by the end of June, mm. by the end of June, we expect to have a winning bidder. Uh, who will, of course, uh, then have to go through security clearance and various other clearances and so on. Uh, and so after the winning bidder is uh, selected, by the end of June, it may take uh, another four or five months or so to actually go through the whole legal closing process. Okay. So by the end of calendar year 2018, we expect that Air India will have moved from public hands into private hands. Navi Mumbai Airport is moving forward very well now. All the important uh, tenders have been awarded. All the work is ongoing. Nonetheless, it's still going to take four to five years before it is fully operational. Uh, we have one runway and one terminal ready to go. That's the timeline we're working on right now. With that, we're completely timed out on this edition of Business Saturday. Thanks for watching and keep it with CNBC TV 18.